Med två veckor kvar till det amerikanska presidentvalet så är det den sittande presidenten George Bush som har en knapp ledning i opinionsmätningarna. Och det ska ju normalt mycket till för att den sittande president inte ska bli omvald. I det här fallet så är det ju dessutom en krigspresident och i besvärliga tider så brukar amerikanerna sluta upp kring sin ledare. Men samtidigt så har det på senare tid blivit uppenbart att administrationen farit med osanning i den kanske viktigaste valfrågan, den om kriget mot Irak. Försvarsministern har offentligt erkänt att det inte fanns någon koppling mellan 11 september-attentatet och Irak. Och inte heller har man funnit några massförstörelsevapen, vilket ju var det andra starka skälet till kriget. I kvällens film i dokument utifrån så pekas istället på den speciella uppfattning om USAs roll i världen som den nykonservativa och djupt religiösa George Bush och männen runt omkring honom har. Man pekar på detta som en orsak till kriget och till utrikespolitiken. Den här filmen är gjord av Schweizaren William Carell som också gjorde serien om CIA som vi visat här i dokument utifrån tidigare. Det är en personlig granskning och uppgörelse med George Bush politik och rader av folk med insyn i den amerikanska politiken medverkar. Världen enligt Bush. To those of you who received honors, awards and distinctions. I say well done. And to the C students, I say you too can be president of the United States. We have elected a puppet for a president. Actually, we didn't elect him. He was appointed. His brother Jeb stole 50,000 votes in, in Florida, and his father's Supreme Court appointed him. You know, if God has spoken to you and said you're going to be president, you don't have to worry about court decisions or recounts or things like that. All right, so he became president, but he didn't know why. And on September 11th, he discovered why. <laughs> on the way to Washington to serve as your president. I'm excited about the work. I'll come back to see you soon. God bless. I januari 2001 flyttade George W. Bush från hemstaten Texas till Washington. Han hade just vunnit det mest omdiskuterade och förvirrade valet i USAs politiska historia. Åtta år efter fadern George Bush den äldre blev George W. Bush ledare för jordens mäktigaste nation. Alla viktigare händelser under de senaste tolv åren har inträffat med en Bush vid statsrodret. Sovjetunionens och kommunistblockets sammanbrott, Kuwaitkriget, terrordåden den 11 september, terrorismens globala utbredning och Irakkriget. He's the spoiled child of a rich family. And while he was growing up he had an awful lot of fun. A lot of parties, a lot of girls, a lot of alcohol, normal story. At a certain point, he had a religious experience. God spoke to him and said, uh, prepare yourself, I have a mission for you. And he stopped drinking and he stopped philandering. He considers he turned himself around because of, of religion. And he deals with a lot of very conservative people and they truly believe that they are right. För en tidning i Austin förklarade George Bush: "Jag har en guddomlig mission att föra in en biblisk världsåskådning i USA:s politik." David Frum, före detta talskrivare åt Bush, var med när presidenten i det ovala rummet berättade för protestantiska församlingsmedlemmar hur Gud hade räddat honom från spriten. He said, um, you know, I shouldn't be here. I should be on a bar stool in Texas and I'm only here because of the power of prayer because I found God. 
when I entered the West Wing, the very first thing I heard said was, you were missed at Bible study. Because they would have, the evangelicals had a weekly Bible study, they had Christian fellowship. And um, the religion was very important to that staff and very important to that presidency. I think Bush overdoes the religious aspect. It makes me uneasy, and I think it makes many Americans uneasy. It is not true that George Bush goes down on his knees and asks God, what should I do? The idea that, that God gives him every morning an agenda, no, that, that George Bush does not think like that, but he finds his source of strength in a religious faith. I mean, this administration kotos to religion, to extreme religion. Bush's strongest, his, his base, his strong base, is the, is the religious, conservative right wing. Predikanten Jerry Falwell, som grundade Moral Majority, skyllde terrordåden den 11 september på hedningar och homosexuella. Bush deklarerade, låt oss be om Guds vishet och närvaro i det vi företar oss. Det här korståget, kriget mot terrorismen, kommer att ta sin tid. Sätt dåt chrétien a une politique étrangère soutien à Israël parce que ce sont sont des gens qui savent se battre et aussi parce qu'il y a une, une teinture très anti musulmane chez ces gens-là. I think Mohammed was a terrorist. He uh, I read enough of the history of his life written by both Muslims and and non-Muslims that he was a a violent man, a man of war. If we are in harmony with God, then we should love people. If Islam is, is in contact with some spiritual force, as they claim to be, would that spiritual force want to annihilate everyone that disagreed with them? Well, that would be another Hitler, a white supremacist. I mean, this is terrible thought. I don't hate the Arab people. I got Arab friends. I love them. But I'm a Bible believer, and uh, see, God gave that land to Abraham, to the Jew. And uh, I, I, I use a little cliche saying that uh, every grain of sand on that little piece of geography uh, called Israel belongs to the Jewish people. Up to 60 million people that, that identify themselves with the Christian right believe that the, this, the state of Israel must exist at, at the end of history. And that's how we're all going to go to heaven. If it doesn't exist, if it's overrun by Muslims, we're going to go to hell. Det här kunde vara Jerusalem, men vi är faktiskt i hjärtat av Colorado. Inga deltagare är judiska, varken på scenen eller i publiken. Det här är Christian Coalition of America som håller sin årliga kongress. Tusentals människor har samlats för att hylla staten Israel. De reser till Jerusalem för att stödja Israel och de gör det för att de tror att Israel bara är en etapp på väg mot kristendomens slutliga seger. De anser att judarna genom sitt förnekande av Jesus förtränger sin andliga verklighet. Efter den avgörande kampen mellan gott och ont kommer många judar att omvändas till kristendomen medan de som inte har tron är dömda till undergång. They are the most unrestrained total supporters of Israel that you can find in the world. There's a much higher percentage of American Christian evangelicals that support Israel than of American Jews, believe me. You have an alliance in the United States, which is a very important alliance. Uh, it's not on paper, it's, it's a de facto alliance between the Christian right and uh, the uh, uh, Israeli lobby. There's a direct uh, alliance there, and it's a rather unusual alliance. The first time I've seen it in my lifetime. Ariel Sharon's framträdande inför de kristna sionisterna framkallar ovationer. För dem är Sharon utvald av Gud för att genomföra profetiorna fram till tidernas fullbordan. With God's help and your solidarity, we will win. We will win. Prime Minister Sharon has been received nine times by President Bush for private meetings, which is more than any other leader in the world. Welcome, Mr. Prime Minister. Thank Glad you. you're here. The only way to understand American foreign policy in the Middle East is to understand that Israel is an integral part of the American body politic. And just taking it one step further to explain to Arabs 
how they can possibly relate to what we're doing in the Middle East is to think of Israel as the 51st American state. As a matter of fact, we treat Israel better than we treat most American states. Men det starkaste stödet har den israeliska högen bland de nykonservativa i Washington. En liten grupp intellektuella journalister och forskare har tagit sig in i den amerikanska maktapparaten. De leds av biträdande försvarsministern Paul Wolfowitz. Och ända sedan George Bush installerade sig i Vita huset har den här gruppen bestämt den politiska dagordningen i Washington. För dem tror jag att det inte finns några kontradiktioner. Det som är bra för Israel, och jag säger mer för den rätta israelien, är bra för USA och vice versa. Paul Wolfowitz är en man som hittade en champion eller en kaus i Israel and in neoconservatism, and he knows nothing else. And therefore, his personal satisfaction and glorification is wrapped up in using, abusing American power. 1998 skickade Kommittén för fred och säkerhet i Persiska viken ett öppet brev till presidenten som slutade så här. Att störta Saddam är ett allt överskuggande nationellt intresse. Bland undertecknarna fanns Paul Wolfowitz och Richard Pearl. Ils sont ou bien au Pentagone avec Wolfowitz ou bien autour de Cheney. Et, euh, et ça, ça fait une petite équipe extrêmement homogène. C'est une mistake de lump together as one view Paul Wolfowitz and Richard Pearl. Richard Pearl has his own views that he's exercised outside the government. Paul is, of course, an extremely important official as Deputy Secretary of Defense. Richard is uh, merely a private citizen who occasionally gives advice uh, through various advisory boards. Richard Pearl is a conniving, self-serving individual who has manipulated personal relationships into a position of undue power. I think he is one of the three most dangerous people in the United States. Richard Pearl, en av de mest framträdande bland de nykonservativa i Washington, här på semester i sin villa i Provence i Sydfrankrike. Trots att han inte har någon officiell befattning disponerar Pearl ett arbetsrum i Pentagon nära försvarsminister Donald Rumsfeldt. Pearl har dessutom fått tillstånd att direkt ta del av konfidentiell och topphemlig information. Han lever ut en dröm många har i Washington. Att vara med och utforma politiken utan att behöva ta något ansvar. Enligt den amerikanska pressen spelar han en viktig roll i presidentens närhet. No, 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 not at all. I, I'm sometimes amused to see stories about uh, how influential I am in the White House. I have not seen uh, President Bush since the day he took office. We may have influence of a certain sort. We may help people understand the world but we certainly don't have any direct effect on making policy. I don't understand why this is such a mystery to so many people. It's uh, portrayed as a conspiracy. It's nothing of the sort. The people around Bush are not stupid. They're very smart. Uh, they are very calculating and manipulative. They're not deaf or dumb in any sense of the word. And Bush is not blind as much as he's inattentive. I don't think he understands the situation. I don't think he understands the history. I think it would require, he's a, he's a uniquely incurious man. I don't think he reads a lot, but I think he talks a lot to people and he depends a great deal on what people tell him for his information. He is a quick learner. He is able to find out which people have the knowledge that I need, and then he uses them. He soaks up uh, information like a sponge. And he is willing to ask questions or was then willing to ask questions that made it very clear there was a lot he didn't know but he wanted to know i just don't think that uh, uh, bush 43 is a geopolitical thinker uh, he doesn't know too much about the world which is not his fault he simply did not travel i mean bush didn't have a passport until he became president how the, in god's name can he know about foreign policy or foreign countries he hasn't been over, he didn't visit any foreign countries. He knows Texas, he knows Maine, where he takes vacation with his father, and then he has these people who are friends with the family. The people who are the core of his staff 
in the White House were the people who were the core of his staff in Texas. And this is very unusual. He spent six years with these people in Texas watching how they all got along with one another. And it was in Texas where the national media were not watching, where whatever fights people had, they had them back in 1995 and 1996. So Bush does surround himself, as I say, with these very sharp, intelligent people. And to a great extent then, of course they manipulate them. Richard Pearl, Doug Fife, Bernard Lewis, the academic, Wolfowitz, all of them come in there and they say, this is the way the world is. I mean, how would you ever know? It's not that uh, we are an influence on the president. It's that the president's own thinking is rather similar to ours. Les nouveaux conservateurs ne s'intéressent pas beaucoup à la politique intérieure. Eux, c'est vraiment la puissance de l'Amérique, le rôle de l'Amérique dans le monde. If one is a hawk uh, because of a readiness to use force when it is the only thing that has any reasonable chance of success, uh, then, uh, okay, I am guilty as charged. We are obliged, within the limits of our capacities, within the context of sort of reasonable possibility, to support democratic revolution everywhere, always. That's what we are. They believe that they brought down the Soviet Union, okay? They be really believe it. Richard Pearl, Wolfowitz, everybody at the Reagan administration, they believe they took the place down. And so they're saying, well, if we can do it, in the Soviet Union, why not bring out down all this, these evil empires in the Middle East? And they're very clear about this. They were talking about it's time to reform the Middle East. And one of the things they wanted to do was crush Saddam Hussein for the benefit of Israel. There was, par the le marché, this euh, dream of a transformation of the Moyen-Orient so that the people hostile to the United States and to the Occident were eliminated. And Iraq was the country for which we were best prepared, because we had been at war with Iraq since 1990, and we had military options, and we thought we knew a lot about the country, and we were prepared to do that. All they were doing was they needed a pretext. They, they, that's all they needed. Until September 11th, George W. Bush had no program. September 11th comes and imposes on him a mission. C'est une catastrophe qui se produit et qui en même temps euh, est très utile aux gens au pouvoir. Parce que quand euh, le 11 septembre s'est produit, euh, l'équipe de Bush était au pouvoir depuis à peu près 9 mois et pas tout jeu. 9-11 uh, defined his presidency. 9-11 is the day on which he discovered who he was and what he had to do. Our war on terror begins with Al-Qaeda, but it does not end there. It will not end until every terrorist group of global reach has been found, stopped, and defeated. I have a message for our military. Be ready. I've called the armed forces to alert, and there is a reason. The hour is coming when America will act, and you will make us proud. May God grant us wisdom, and may he watch over the United States of America. Thank you. If President Bush had come to Congress on the 20th of September 2001 and said, I am here today to talk about these terrorist attacks, and I think we must re-examine the faults in our own foreign policy that have brought us to this position. And while we will certainly do our best to arrest the people who did these terrible deeds, we must also remember that we have a work of conciliation and appeasement to do in the Middle East, and above all, we must settle the Israeli-Palestinian dispute. If he had said that to Congress and the American people, they would have impeached him. He wouldn't have gotten out of the room alive. C'est le lendemain du 11 septembre qu'un certain nombre de, de membres de l'administration du côté du Pentagone sont venus trouver le vice-président pour lui dire c'est le moment de c'est le moment de, de renverser enfin le régime de Saddam Hussein. They made a decision on 9/11 that this was the excuse they needed to go in and finish up Saddam Hussein. 
That was the plan. And this administration was indeed waiting for a pretext. General Clark has said publicly that on 9-11, as American couples were holding hands and jumping to their death, the White House called him and said, pin it on a rock. They weren't thinking about the Americans dying. They weren't thinking about the, the people who were committing suicide in order to escape the flames. They were thinking about 9-11 not as an attack, but as a gift. Do it. They, they had the opportunity. And linking al-Qaeda and Hussein was, was a lie, but that isn't what they wanted to do. Det var vicepresident Dick Cheney som övertygade George Bush om nödvändigheten av en militär aktion mot Irak. Samma inställning hade han som försvarsminister 12 år tidigare under Kuwaitkriget. Lika framgångsrik var Paul Wolfowitz med den nuvarande försvarsministern Donald Rumsfeld. Han lade beslag på posten som biträdande försvarsminister för att hålla ett öga på Colin Powell som han sa till Rumsfeld. Den 17 september 2001 samlades hela teamet på presidentens ranch för att planera hur man skulle störta Saddam Hussein. There was discussion about Iraq uh, right after September 11. I don't believe a decision was made at that uh, at that point. Paul Wolfowitz uh, started talking up Iraq. Iraq is the real culprit. Well, I mean, how can Bush decide whether it's the real culprit or not? If Paul Wolfowitz tells him that it is, you trust Paul Wolfowitz. I think the inclination was there with Cheney. I think it is very clear Paul Wolfowitz pushed every opportunity he had to suggest that we should engage in regime change. It's quite true that Wolfowitz was for invading Iraq very early. There may be circumstances in which uh, we know that we are about to be attacked. And in those circumstances, if we can prevent that attack by striking first, of course, we should do that. It's perfectly normal. If they'd come to the American people and said, look, we want to engage in a, in a war of conquest, in effect, to reestablish the balance politically in the Middle East, I don't think people would have gone along with it. The president basically has let the public believe a lie, which is that Iraq played a role in 9-11, which is nonsense. But he's done that uh, entirely on his own. It's not that he's been unduly influenced by a small group of people. Believe me, the people who per perpetuated this lie, the neoconservatives around Bush and the others, knew all that. They knew what effect it was having on the public. But I think what September 11th showed is if 19 people using nothing more than conventional airliners can kill 3,000 people in one day, and we start to look at the weapons that those people were exploring even on September 11th, and the potential for groups like that ultimately to inflict not 3,000 in one day, not 30,000, but 300,000 or maybe 3 million, then you realize this is not an evil we can continue to live with. It's an evil that has to be eradicated. Lisez les discours uh, de M. Bush, de M. Cheney, de M. Rumsfeld, tout au long de cette période avant la guerre en Irak, mais après le 11 septembre, C'est très subtil. La première phrase, on parle de Saddam Hussein. La deuxième phrase, on parle euh, du 11 septembre. La troisième phrase, on parle de Bin Laden. On ne les lit pas vraiment explicitement ensemble, mais pour ceux qui écoutent plus ou moins, les trois phrases se mélangent et se mêlent. Et l'idée est là, euh, au niveau de la conscience du peuple américain, qu'il y a un lien entre ces trois faits et ces trois événements. Le président est revenu plusieurs fois sur les liens entre Al-Qaïda et Saddam Hussein. 18 journalistes ont posé des questions. Une sur les rapports entre le président et le seigneur, 15 autres sur l'Irak. Pas un n'a soulevé le problème du lien entre Al-Qaïda et Saddam Hussein. Ils ont avalé ça totalement. I've never believed that from the very beginning. Why would Saddam Hussein risk being involved with al-Qaeda. He has no record of trusting terrorist groups. He's played with them, but di dictators in the Middle East don't trust terrorist groups. I don't see how you could deny it. And you know, for Richard Pearl, you know, I, you know here's this guy, I was on TV with him. He said this in public. That bastard Saddam Hussein was responsible for September 11th. When he knew very well that there was no basis for this story, um, 
and started this myth about Saddam being behind September 11th. There's just no evidence. När Bush bad Frum att skriva talet till nationen som han skulle hålla vid kongressens öppnande ville presidenten gärna ha något lika slagkraftigt som det onda imperiet, Ronald Reagans famösa beteckning på Sovjetunionen. I den originala draften var frasen was axis of hatred. But writing for the president of the United States is very much like writing for a major Hollywood film production. You write your words and then they go into a gigantic bureaucratic process and you revise and you work with others. He's like a character in a movie and you think of him that way. What would George Bush say about this? And you try to absorb the way he thinks, the way he communicates, his values, his feelings, so that you can answer for him what he would say if he had the time. And I was asked, if the president wants to take the war beyond Afghanistan, how would he explain to the American people why and why, why he is doing what he is doing? Could you come up with an example of how we could speak? So I wrote a section, like uh, a page or two, on that question. And my material then became the basis of the section of the speech that dealt with Iraq. Our war against terror is only beginning. Iraq continues to flaunt its hostility toward America and to support terror. The Iraqi regime has plotted to develop anthrax and nerve gas and nuclear weapons for over a decade. This is a regime that agreed to international inspections, then kicked out the inspectors. This is a regime that has something to hide from the civilized world. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil arming to threaten the peace of the world by seeking weapons of mass destruction. These regimes pose a grave and growing danger. The price of indifference would be catastrophic. And it really rested on one principle that Saddam Hussein possessed real significant weapons of mass destruction now, today. Not that he was building them, not that he wanted them in the future, not that he had them in the past. It was that he had them today. We know that Saddam built weapons of mass destruction. He used them. And we know that he refused to explain what had happened to them. These people came to their conclusions and then looked for intelligence to support it. And when they couldn't find intelligence to support it, they created lies to the American public, to the American Congress, to the United Nations, and to the rest of the world. They lied to the world. I 18 månader förde regeringen fram samma budskap om och om igen. Undergången var nära. There is no doubt that Saddam Hussein now has weapons of mass destruction. There is no doubt that he is amassing them to use against our friends, against our allies, and against us. Our enemies have declared this very intention and have been caught seeking these terrible weapons. We're talking about anthrax. We're talking about botulinum toxin. We're talking about nuclear weapons programs. It clearly would be unhelpful if, if terrorists got their hands on some of uh, Iraq's uh, chemical or biological capabilities. It is a shell game played on a grand scale with deadly serious weapons. It's trying to shake the will of America and the civilized world. And this country will not be intimidated. What he wants is time and more time to husband his resources, to invest in his ongoing chemical and biological weapons program, and to gain possession of nuclear weapons. The United States of America will not permit the world's most dangerous regimes to threaten us with the world's most destructive weapons. C'est ça qui est inquiétant, de voir avec quelle facilité euh, une propagande bien organisée, répétitive, enfonçant le même clou dans les têtes, à quel point ça peut être efficace. This administration has chosen to use the propaganda tools of Hitler and Goering and Goebbels. Mais quand même pas un régime nazi. Mais quand même, quand Goebbels disait que Si on répète un mensonge assez souvent, euh, les gens le, l'avalent, et pas tort. Et c'est ça qu'on a vu se produire à ce moment-là. We have to scare the hell out of the people of the United States. 
I think Bush and Cheney, and I don't approve of this, I think Bush and Cheney were engaged in scaring the people, trying to unite public opinion. This was necessary for him to convince the public that this was an issue, this was a problem, this was a threat that had to be dealt with immediately. And there was no time to try any other alternative courses of action. Over the years, we've tried limited strikes against military facilities. It didn't work. We've offered Iraq the path of voluntary disarmament and inspections. The Iraqi regime is rejecting it. He said the UN inspectors had concluded that there were massive stockpiles of weapons, of, uh, of chemical weapons and biological weapons. Now, the problem with all this is there was no evidence to back it up. The UN inspectors never said that. Vita Husets strategi var uppdelad i två etapper. I den första skulle man göra sig av med FNs vapeninspektörer som fortfarande inte hittade några massförstörelsevapen och envisades med att säga det högt. I den andra etappen skulle man visa att massförstörelsevapen fanns. Wolfowitz och Ramsfeldt koncentrerade sig på att misskreditera Hans Blix, chefen för FNs vapeninspektörer. Blix drogs i smutsen av Bush-administrationen. Till slut gav han upp och reste hem. I en intervju för den brittiska tidningen Guardian levererade han ett föga diplomatiskt motangrepp. Jag blev smutskastad av Pentagon som spred rykten och illvilliga påståenden i medierna. De skitstövlarna förföljde mig i tre år. Perhaps I had not really thought that that particular word was as strong in American English as, as, as it was. I had heard it many times in my student days in England, in, in England and didn't think it was so hard. But maybe I should have used another word. Maybe I should have, should have said skunk. I think the drivers of this are at the top levels of the Defense Department, people like Wolf, the Hawks like Wolfowitz. I mean, they're, these are people who, who, in whose interest it was to see Blix discredited. There was a fairly severe, uh, you might say, smear campaign by, by media. We cannot wait for the final proof, the smoking gun, that could come in the form of a mushroom cloud. The London Times had an article in which the, uh, co their New York correspondent suggested that I should turn the smoking gun on my own head. They did so for a reason. I suppose, and that was that they felt they might not have cons convinced their constituents, their parliaments, or the Congress to go to war simply by saying that we, we suspect that would not have been enough. If Americans believed Blix, we wouldn't have gone to war when we did. So you, Americans had to not believe Blix. They probably had many other reasons too why they wanted to go for Saddam. Mr. Wolfowitz has said that the choice of weapons of mass destruction as a reason was a bureaucratic one, that this was one that everybody could agree on. It was a hyping, I think. It was a spin. It was very hard to see that the Iraqis were terribly dangerous in the year 2002 and 2003. The vice president gave some speeches in August of 2002 in which he did not conceal that he thought inspections were useless at the best. And I think Mr. Wolfowitz was of the same view. Now, Colin Powell, who is supposed to be the smart one in this administration, is the one, I remind everybody, who stood up before the United Nations and claimed there are weapons of mass destruction. Iraq declared 8,500 liters of anthrax. But UNSCOM estimates that Saddam Hussein could have produced 25 thousand liters. He had gone through the evidence, so he must, uh, he took responsibility for what he said. And uh, it's, it's quite clear that not, not all of what he said there really held water. How much longer are we willing to put up with Iraq's non-compliance before we, as a council, we as the United Nations say, enough, enough. Saddam Hussein and his regime are busy doing all they possibly can to ensure that inspectors succeed in finding absolutely nothing. It's a little like uh, the, the witch hunting in the Middle Ages. Like, you know, you are convinced there are witches. Well, then you look out and you find them. <laughs> and here too, they were convinced that there were weapons of mass destruction. And therefore, you are inclined to interpret anything 
as evidence of that. Every year the United Nations said, stop, tell us what you're doing, and they did not. Well, finally, President Bush, Prime Minister Blair, and Mr. Berlusconi, Mr. Aznar, and many other leaders in the world said this has to come to an end. The problem is you really shouldn't be going to war, a preemptive war, based on a suspicion or a belief. I mean, you should have some proof. I mean, there was no proof. That's the point. This is clearly a totally unsatisfactory that the, the world's biggest governments can go ahead on the basis of such information. I saw a former Jordanian prime minister for dinner and I said, what if we don't find the weapons of mass destruction? And he said to me, you'd better invent them. När nu Hans Blix var ur vägen återstod det bara att bevisa att Saddam Hussein hade köpt anrika att uran till sitt kärnvapenprogram. Men sådana anklagelser måste komma från någon som stod höjd över alla misstankar. Vita huset föreslog Joe Wilson, god vän till presidentfamiljen. Wilson var den sista amerikanska diplomat som träffade Saddam Hussein i Bagdad. För sitt mord under Kuwaitkriget blev han dekorerad av president Bush den äldre. Dick Cheney bad CIA kontakta Wilson om ett synnerligen känsligt uppdrag. Joe Wilson was a very able ambassador. Gave money to Bush one. Uh, and Wilson was called by the CIA to go to a country whose people he knew and check out a rumor that the country of Niger had sold a uh, yellow cake, which is a material you'd use in part of nuclear weapons production, to Iraq. The neocons around the president, around President Bush, had been citing this, including Cheney, had been citing this as a reason to invade Iraq. Je leur ai dit au moment de, où on a pris la décision que j'irais, mais seulement comme représentant du gouvernement, c'est-à-dire comme quelqu'un qui, qui pose des questions de la part de mon gouvernement, pas du CIA. Je ne suis pas espion. So he went and he talked to several government officials and asked them how they, uh, what type of businesses, business they do with Iranian, what are the safeguards, what are the protections, and came back and said that it was, in his view, unlikely that such a deal could happen. J'ai fait mon rapport qui disait que non, il n'y avait, avait rien derrière cette histoire. To Wilson's great shock, even though he had learned that, the speech that the president gave in the State of the Union, which is the most important speech an American president can give, cited this thing, saying it was true. The British government has learned that Saddam Hussein recently sought significant quantities of uranium from Africa. Nous savions par les rapports qui ont été faits, y compris le rapport que j'ai fait, que ces informations étaient fausses. Bush is either a liar or he believes it and doesn't know it's not true. Either is bad. Either disqualifies Bush as president. On peut pas dire que c'était les Anglais. On doit carrément dire que c'est quelqu'un dans la Maison Blanche qui avait mis dans son discours quelque chose qui pouvait pas être justifié. Well, Wilson was just appalled by it because he knew it wasn't true. The people at the CIA also knew it wasn't true. They had told the White House before that this was wrong. This started a gigantic fight with CIA people leaking all over the place against the White House. C'est une question, c'était sur lequel ils ont basé la décision d'aller à une guerre qui, qui, non seulement en guerre, mais de faire une guerre qui était l'invasion, la, la conquête et maintenant l'occupation d'un pays souverain. That's when Joe Wilson got very upset. And so he decided to write an op-ed piece for the New York Times describing this experience he had. Well, the political people in the White House were angry. And the way they dealt with this is they decided to leak the story to five different organizations, all friendly news people that had dealt with them in the past. The one organization that took it was, uh, was uh, Robert Novak, the conservative columnist. He calls one of his contacts at the White House. The White House is trying to diminish Joe Wilson and says, oh, and by the way, you know, his wife is with the CIA. And she's the one who had the idea of sending him to Niger. And he ran the story mentioning his, Joe Wilson's wife's name, which is a federal crime. Joe Wilson's wife was a covert operative for the operations directorate of the CIA. And when you mention one of those names, mention a spy's name, you endanger her. Regardez un peu ce qu'ils ont fait. On a compromis tout ce qu'elle a fait depuis 20 ans. Parce que c'est pas seulement la personne, c'est toute sa, sa carrière qui est mise en question. Toutes ses relations avec des étrangers, tout ce qu'elle aurait dû faire pour son pays depuis le temps qu'il a été l'océan. 
that's one of the worst things I've ever heard of anyone doing in the, the White House. The story was ruining her career, but also undermining her, her work. Every operation she was ever involved with, every country she ever visited, would now become the target of opposing forces in those country. So a lot of people's lives were put in danger when he did that. L'idée de prendre un membre de la famille d'un adversaire pour essayer de la discréditer en espérant qu'en la discréditant, on allait discréditer l'adversaire même, c'est complètement... c'est idiot, ça. C'est éthiquement pas admissible. The leak is now being investigated in this country, but it's believed to have come from somebody at the White House, either in the vice president's office or the president's office. It's hard for me to believe that that would have been orchestrated by Bush. I suspect that the President of the United States, the appointed President of the United States, is completely clueless about this and many other things. I believe that these individuals who worked for Dick Cheney, the FBI has now established who it was, they worked for Dick Cheney, and I believe that they acted independently, perhaps, of Cheney's guidance, but with his complete protection. C'était lui qui était le demandeur du rapport que j'ai fait. Et c'est lui qui était avec le président quand on a fait l'analyse et le revue du discours de l'État de l'Union. C'est lui qui restait le plus dur sur la question des armes nucléaires, même après qu'il a reçu non seulement mon rapport, mais tous les autres rapports. Donc je trouve qu'en effet, il est malhonnête dans, son, dans ses discours et dans ses efforts de menacer les Américains et de créer une sorte d'état de, de, de peur. At the White House, George W., avoiding confrontation with journalists, remained desperately silent. President Bush said nothing. He didn't address this. He didn't say, I'm outraged. This is terrible. He didn't say, I want an investigation. He didn't say to his staff, you tell me whether you did this or not. I want you to sign a piece of paper saying you didn't do it. I mean, he did, he did nothing. C'est net et clair que c'était un prétexte. Et si on fait la guerre à Bagdad pour refaire la carte politique du Moyen-Orient. Pure, net et simple. Kongressen var så återhållsam att man undrade om det handlade om en enpartistat. Då grep senatens äldste ledamot Robert Byrd initiativet och kom med ett av de fränaste angreppen sittande amerikansk president någonsin utsatts för. Det var än mer förvånande som Byrd var personlig vän till både George Bush den äldre och Ronald Reagan. There is no debate. There's no discussion. There's nothing. Nothing. The idea that the United States or any other nation can legitimately attack a nation that is not imminently threatening, but which may be threatening in the future. The idea that the United States may attack a sovereign government because of a dislike for a particular regime is a radical new twist on the traditional idea of self-defense. This administration has turned the patient art of diplomacy on its head, turned the patient art of diplomacy into threats, labeling and name-calling of the sort that reflects quite poorly on the intelligence and sensitivity of our leaders and which will have consequences for years to come calling heads of states pygmies, labeling whole countries as evil, denigrating powerful European allies as irrelevant. In only the space of two short years, this reckless, an arrogant administration has initiated policies which may reap disastrous consequences for years. Will we seize Iraq's oil fields? Becoming an occupying power? 
which controls the price and supply of that nation's oil for the foreseeable future? There are some who think so. Frankly, many of the pronouncements made by this administration are outrageous. There's no other word. And yet this chamber is hauntingly silent. Silent. Get your hands up and come outside. Come outside. Everybody in the house needs to come outside. Out here in the yard, out here in the yard. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Right. No one there, no one. No one in there, no one. Let's go, let's go. Let's go, sir. Yeah, clear the house now. Clear the house now. Let's sweep on down straight. Keep going. På Center for Public Integrity arbetar en handfull frivilliga som har beslutat sig för att slå larm om hur George Bush omformar USA i terroristbekämpningens namn. Framförallt vill de visa vilka fri rättigheter som är hotade. Det var det här centret som avslöjade att justitieminister John Ashcroft i hemlighet höll på att utarbeta terroristlagen Patriot Act 2 som skulle ge administrationen rätt att övervaka inte bara landets gränser och utländska medborgare utan också amerikanerna själva. This is our democracy for God's sake. The Patriot 2 Act, Ashcroft and his aides kept that legislation from the public and from their own Republican chairman of the Judiciary Committees in the House and Senate for half a year. They never told them they were planning new legislation. They never showed them the legislation. And when we obtained the legislation, everyone, including Republicans in Congress, were utterly astonished because no one told them. It was simply just a, uh, an internal circulation that was unfortunately uh, 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 disclosed uh, in an un unauthorized manner, uh, prematurely, really, uh, to, the, uh, to the public. What is that about? When did we start developing secret legislation that changes our rights and liberties. We're constantly challenging ourselves with, uh, uh, with ideas, some of them crazy, some of them stupid. This is not the United States of America. There's something very odd. Whatever we think of the substance of that legislation, that's inappropriate. We supervise uh, a workforce of 168,000 persons. Some of those persons will make mistakes. USA Patriot Act II was more of a think piece. Vid ett din som hade svurits in i presidentens närvaro fick uppdraget att sammanställa åtgärdspaketet som skulle ge myndigheterna obegränsad tillgång till medborgarnas personliga uppgifter och rätt till hemliga undersökningar av personlig egendom samt telefonavlyssning över hela landet. This new law that I signed today will allow surveillance of all communications used by terrorists including emails, the internet and cell phones. On peut demander à n'importe quelle bibliothèque publique de, de communiquer la liste des livres euh, qu'empruntent qu euh, leurs clients. They simply get a subpoena in, from a criminal grand jury in order to obtain such records from businesses, including libraries and bookstores, if they have re evidence relevant to a criminal investigation. They can spy on anybody. They can get your phone records. They can get your credit card records. They can find your library books you read. They will go after you, and they do it, and they do it quite proudly. Operation Tips hade ett gratis nummer som folk kunde ringa anonymt dygnet runt för att anmäla grannar, vänner eller släktingar som uppträdde misstänkt eller fällde statsfientliga kommentarer. John Ashcroft förklarade, vi vände upp och ner på systemet men vi hade goda skäl. Det var ett nationellt krisläge. People have an obligation to contribute to the protection of that freedom, of that uh, security. We are asking all U.S. citizens to come forward to the FBI with any valuable information they have to help us apprehend terrorists or to stop terrorist attacks. The idea was that they were going to have mailmen, uh, people who read meters for the electricity and the gas, uh, uh, anybody who sees anything that they think is suspicious to call and report people into the government because they know best who is, uh, the, uh, the, who is out of place, who, uh, the, who looks suspicious. 
uh, and it is no more than simply a reporting of suspicious activity to uh, the law enforcement authorities. The last country that did this, that I know about, was the Soviet Union, where you had people that would, in your apartment block who would, who would rat on you if you had the wrong book or if you had, and that's what they were trying to create here. And that's what TIPS was. When Americans start pointing the fingers at other Americans saying, you're no good, you're a communist, you're, you're, you're a red, you're this, you're that. Now it's you're an Arab, you're Al Qaeda, but whatever it is. When we start doing all this, we're kind of becoming what we're supposed to be fighting. You know, I mean, this is the kind of stuff the Taliban did. So now we're gonna do it. We're gonna say, well, we wanna know what you read. We wanna know what you do. We wanna know what you say, what you buy, what you rent, who you see, who you have dinner with. This is not America. They've got no Arab students there because they can't pass the visa exam. Friends of mine are being stopped at the border and asked to provide um, certificates from the police department that they're not criminals. Three delstater and 235 states declared that they did not think to tillämpa lagarna in their områden. De ifrågasatte de nya lagarna, varnade för överdrifter i kriget mot terrorismen och anklagade regeringen för maktmissbruk. Dick Cheney sa rakt på sak. Jag ser det som en ny normal situation. Jag tror att det här kommer att bli ett bestående inslag i vårt sätt att leva. I am always constantly afraid of Big Brother, of George Orwell. Those kinds of activities can quickly turn ourselves into a Gestapo state. Won't come easily to America, but it could come here. It could come here because fascism finally is the deterioration of democracy uh, as well as the upsurge of, of an, uh, an autocratic, oppressive uh, notions of government. And it can come from either direction. Democracies can crumble and oppressions can become so powerful that you can call them fascisms. We are going after these people and we are going to prevail in court, I hope, I believe, because they are hiding the truth. En annan uppgift för centret är kampen mot korruptionen och de enorma vinster man kan göra på kriget i Irak. Bush and Cheney are the first time that we've had two businessmen, two oil executives become president and vice president. This is utterly uh, unprecedented in US history. There are certain companies, dozens and dozens, hundreds of companies that are getting phenomenally, obscenely rich. And guess what? Uh, two thirds or three quarters of those companies give their campaign contributions to the Republican Party and the George W. Bush in, in incredible gratitude for this wonderful time they're having. And all of it is in the name of national security. And uh, while we have a flag in the background and we, we put our hand over our heart and say the Pledge of Allegiance, we're getting rich. This administration, is behaving like pigs at the trough. They're saying, we want it all. We want to take it all. We, we went in there, we got them out, and we're, gonna, we're now going to take all the business. Dick Cheney said, well, you know, unfortunately, God put oil <laughs> in certain countries, and you can't control that. Vice President Dick Cheney was tidigare högste chef for Halliburton, a world-leading företag in the oil industry. I en artikel i Washington Post nyligen avslöjades det att Halliburton under Dick Cheneys ledning fortsatte att handla med Irak trots blockaden. En vecka innan Cheney svors in som vicepresident slutade han på Halliburton med aktieoptioner för över 45 miljoner dollar som avgångsvedelag. This has been a bonanza period for the company. They're doing quite well, thank you very much. Um, and having your former president and CEO as the vice president obviously has not hurt one bit. Halliburton, Dick Cheney's company, effectively stole 61, $61 million since April. Is I find that astonishing. And everybody knew it. Anybody who deals in Iraq knows that gasoline was being sold at enormous margins. It seems to be that they bought the uh, petrol for one euro and sold it for three. It's outrageous. Nobody had a chance to bid. And then we're told that Halliburton then, in, in turn, after it gets $600 million, will uh, put up other contracts, subcontracts, to bidding. So it, it struck us as a little uh, dubious. Well, I think this is part of a very small, organized mafia that is taking advantage of the American public. Look, they're all crooks. Hey, hey, you know, every contract in Iraq today is tailor-made for Kellogg Brown Root 
which is which is Cheney's company, it's a subsidiary of Halliburton. You can't go into Iraq unless you deal with an American company. Den amerikanska vapentillverkaren Lockheed Martin har också nära relationer med Bush-administrationen eftersom vicepresidentens hustru Lynn Cheney sitter i företagets styrelse. Mrs. Cheney being on the corporate board of a company getting federal government contracts and not resigning immediately when her husband took power as vice president is highly unusual. In fact, I don't know of a single time in US history not in any recent like half century that I'm of contemporary America where uh, the spouse of a vice president was getting money from a corporation getting government contracts. It's, it's such an obvious conflict of interest. It is so obviously inappropriate. Uh, and what is most incredible to me is when news reports of that connection surfaced, uh, she had a very defiant response. Basically, you can all go to hell. <laughs> I will continue to serve on this board. Liksom George Bush och hans far har presidentens närmaste rådgivare nära band med vapen och oljeindustrin. Presidentens främste rådgivare Carl Rove var förut aktieägare i Boeing som tillverkar Apache-helikoptrar, missiler och kryssningsrobotar av typ Tomahawk. Paul Wolfowitz, andre mannen i Pentagon, tog emot konsultarboden av Northrop Grumman innan han hamnade i regeringen. Northrop Grumman tillverkar attackplanet F-18 som har använts i Irak. Donald Rumsfeld och Colin Powell har varit direktörer på Gulfstream Aerospace. De lämnade bolaget med ett gyllene handslag på en miljon dollar. I mars 2003 avslöjade tidningen New Yorker att Richard Pearl var delägare i företaget Trireme. Medan Pearl satt i Pentagon var Trireme's omsättning 45 miljoner dollar. Över hälften kom från Boeings militära dotterbolag. Come on, he, the guy writes an article in the Wall Street Journal and but forgets to tell the reader that he took 20 million, 20 million dollars for Boeing. Clearly making a money from his close association with the president. The president did not have any problem with this. He didn't rebuke Pearl publicly. Well, it's it's starting to look like a third world republic, isn't it? Banana Republic. På två år har Northrop Grumman, det amerikanska flygvapnets främste leverantör, ökat försäljningen med 60 procent. Boeing med 30 procent och Lockheed Martin med 25 procent. Los Angeles Times skrev: Ingen tidigare administration har tillåtit sig ens en tiondel av det som har skett under George W. Bush. Ingen. Multinational corporations have no ethics. They will deal with the devil himself if they can make a profit. Men familjen Bush har i flera generationer varit nära förbunden med näringslivet. Do you mind if I peek at some of the family photos? There he is Here's right there. swearing in as the 41st president. And this is an interesting picture. This is three generations of Bushes. Senator Bush, President Bush and President Bush. Den nuvarande presidentens farfar Prescott Bush kunde glädja sig åt en lysande karriär inom bankväsendet, blev en ansedd republikansk senator och spelade golf med Eisenhower. Well, it's an interesting family. Prescott Bush was was the grandfather, the patriarch of the family. And Prescott Bush in the 1940s had an interesting role. He was an investment banker for Brown Brothers Harriman. Unfortunately, at the very same time he was doing those things, he was the secret banker for Adolf Hitler and the Thyssen family. And he moved money for the Nazis. While his son was fighting them in, in the Pacific, fighting their allies in the Pacific, dad was home doing that. Alla Prescott Bushs bolag övertogs av staten med motiveringen att de hade samarbetat med nazityskland. Ett av hans företag bedrev gruvdrift i Polen och använde koncentrationslägerfångar som tvångsarbetskraft. About a week ago, the records showing Prescott Bush's connections to the Hitler government were released in the National Archives. Do you know there wasn't one story about that on any television network? 
you know, I don't think the public really ever has looked that closely at the Bush family um, uh, today or in the past. Tio år före Kuwaitkriget hade George W. Bushs far som var vicepresident under Ronald Reagan erbjudit Irak amerikanskt stöd i kriget mot Iran. På den tiden var George Bush och Saddam Hussein vänner. Well, I wouldn't have called him a friend in particular. We had relations with the Saddam Hussein regime just like we've had relations with any number of uh, tyrannical regimes around the world. Uh, we tried to moderate his behavior. George Bush, when he was vice president of Ronald Reagan, actually set up Saddam Hussein, actually backed him, actually put him into power, and his envoy in all this was then, the sec was then in private citizen, the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld. He actually went to see Saddam and then came back and recommended we support him. We created Saddam Hussein, just like we created bin Laden. The United States of America creates its own enemies. It was blowing up in our face and we didn't know it, and we were too stupid to see it. And that is the legacy of, of George Bush's father. The idea was to keep the war going as long as possible so they would destroy each other. It was astonishingly uh, cynical and Machiavellian. There was some modest uh, cooperation between the United States and the Saddam Hussein regime. It is simply not correct to say we gave them massive supply of weapons. We gave them some intelligence on order of battle information. We were willing to give Saddam Hussein anything in the world to hurt the Iranians. Bob Woodward på Washington Post har avslöjat att CIA försåg Irakerna med spionfotografier från amerikanska plan för att de effektivare skulle kunna bomba de iranska trupperna. I över fyra år hade Saddam tillgång till amerikanskt material och fick kunskap om hur USA skaffade sig underrättelser. The CIA helped the Iraqis by providing not satellite photography, I don't believe, but with the information off of satellite photography. Yes, the CIA cooperated with Saddam Hussein in 1984. We know that. They did give satellite photography. I mean, it was the CIA that helped win the war for Saddam. They informed the Iraqis, the United States government, when there was going to be an attack. We were providing direct intelligence support, including signals intercepts, not just imagery. Um, and the bottom line is we chose to support Iraq over Iran and we were willing to overlook genocide on Saddam's part. The United States tilted a little bit uh, toward uh, Iraq. That is not a policy that I liked very much. Um, I didn't participate in that, uh, in that policy. Under sin tid som vicepresident beväpnade och finansierade George Bush den äldre Saddam. 1986 skickade man under största sekretess stammar av mjältbrandsbakterier till Irak. The, the, we had given them anthrax? That's crazy. That's just absolutely untrue. In fact, we prevented that. Uh, during the Reagan administration, the Pentagon stopped the shipment of anthrax. So, I mean, it may be that something or other got through, but policy was never to give any such thing to Iraq. I oktober 1992 fann en senatsutredning att USA hela 60 gånger under 80-talet hade levererat biologiskt material till Saddams militära laboratorier. Byggnadsfirman Bechtel, då led av Reagans tidigare ministrar George Shultz och Kaspar Weinberger, fick de irakiska myndigheternas uppdrag att bygga de fabriker där Saddam skulle framställa sina biologiska vapen. I remember it very well because I was writing about it in the newspaper at the time, criticizing Reagan and even more Bush the father for his administration helping Saddam Hussein after the use of chemical weapons against the Kurds I thought it was clear what Saddam Hussein's intentions were uh, and that we needed to oppose him not help him and um, Bush the father read those articles denied them has never forgiven me for writing them we were fully aware of it our ambassador knew it, our, our military advisors to him knew it, Colin Powell, who was visiting, knew it, a number of people knew it, and we still supplied aid to him. So 10 years later to say that he, he's a terrorist, he's this guy and that, because he used poison gas, is absolutely disingenuous and, and, uh, and, and ridiculous. 
Sam Gwynn har publicerat en rad artiklar och skrivit en bok om Burstinastin, om fyra generationer av affärsskandaler, om privata och finansiella nätverk som går i arv från far till son, om George Bush den äldres affärer med familjen Bin Laden. Familjen Bush är den första amerikanska politiska klanen som haft nära relationer till de oljerika kungafamiljerna i Mellanöstern. Saudiska prinsar, familjen Bin Laden och familjen Bush har ofta gjort affärer med varandra. I don't know if there's a Bush dynasty, but Bush and his son have been much too willing to sell out the American interest to those who pay them. For the father, the the moment he left the White House, he goes off to Saudi Arabia to do business for the Carlyle Group, where he's a consultant. It is what they call in America the revolving door in Washington, where you go, you know, you're, 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 you suddenly one day you're in the Defense Department, like Frank Carlucci, and then suddenly you're, you're then out um, uh, working for a company that has business with the Defense Department. Carlyle är ett av de största privata finansbolagen i USA och hanterar investeringar för nära 16 miljarder dollar. Carlyle grundades och leds av Frank Carlucci, tidigare ställföreträdande chef för CIA och försvarsminister under Ronald Reagan. Men Carlyle är mer än ett finansbolag. Idag är verksamheten till större delen knuten till försvarssektorn. Dotterbolaget United Defense Industries tillverkar stridsvagnar som används i Irak och de missiler som ligger redo på USAs krigsfartyg. And all we know is that people leave the government and for some reason they work for the Carlyle Group. But what value do they add? It's like the mafia, it's a small family and, and Carlucci was the head of it. <laughs> there's, there's nothing mysterious about Carlyle. We're a private equity house, basically owned by the partners, of which I am one. Uh, we invest in companies, we buy companies, we probably control 17 or 18 European country, companies, mainly in the engineering area. And on the advisory board, you have George H.W. Bush. Uh, I don't know how we distinguish him, 41. Um, H.W. Uh, Bush, James Baker, the former Secretary of State, Frank Carlucci, these people are all, they're all major Bush-era politicians. Some of our companies uh, do deal with government. We have a company that does security clearances for the Air Force. We have a company that builds some of the armored vehicles uh, for the Army. This is historically unprecedented. We have never had a former U.S. president helping a defense contractor at during a time of war. And we've never had this, this odd circumstance of that happening while the former president's son is a sitting U.S. president. I mean, this is an extraordinary, utterly peculiar uh, situation. But they don't call it corruption. They call it business. Did you ever see The Godfather? It's just business. <laughs> Klockan nio på morgonen den 11 september 2001 inleddes Carlyle Groups årliga investerarkonferens på Ritz-Carlton Hotel i Washington. Mötet leddes av styrelseordföranden Frank Carlucci. Bredvid honom satt Shafiq Bin Laden och Samas bror som representerar familjen Bin Laden inom Carlyle Group. You know, top officials from the former administrations, the Bush administration, were meeting with the Carlucci group and the Bin Laden family on the 11th of September in a nice hotel. It was all, everybody was friendly. They were talking about business. Like everybody else who was an investor, they were entitled to attend uh, the investor conference. It was entirely a matter of their choice. So it's, it's interesting at this time, you have Bin Laden. There's two Bin Ladens, I guess. It was a brother of Bin Laden that was meeting with the Carlyle group. Yeah, he was the head of the, the Bin Laden group. Anybody who, as I say, who had invested in Carlisle was able to attend. They were actually sitting there when the airplanes hit the World Trade Center and then shortly after the Pentagon. It is correct that uh, in September 11th of that year, uh, we were having an investor conference when uh, uh, the attack on the World Trade Center took place. My guess is that Carlisle has uh, severed all its connections with the Bin Laden family since, uh, since September 11. The problem is that uh, at the highest levels of government, the implications of Saudi policy were not understood. 
the Bush family's very good friend, Prince Bandar, their ambassador here, arranged for chartered planes, while no Americans were allowed to fly, to pick up all the members of the bin Laden family and other Saudis and take them home. The only jet allowed to fly in the United States the day after 9-11, it picked up all of bin Laden's family members and flew them immediately to Saudi Arabia. I mean, if I were, I'm sorry, but if I were the U.S. government, I would have let him pick up all of bin Laden's relatives, and then I would have put them immediately into detention and interrogated all of them. We far too long accepted the Saudi version of reality that they sell to us and ignored what's really going on in that country. The Saudis spend more money in Washington than almost any other government. They put the money around in law firms and lobbying groups, and they put the money into campaigns. That paid for a Colin Powell to go to Tufts University to give a speech for 15 minutes. And how much did he get for going to Boston? $200,000 plus a first class ticket. You know, like the next week he became Secretary of State. That was Saudi money. We have essentially been whores, political whores for the Saudis for the last 40 years. This is a country that has been buying off people for years. They buy off people, they buy off lobbyists and lawyers on K Street here in Washington. They buy off politicians by hiring them as advisors, by investing in their children's companies as they did with the Bush family. George W. Bush, the president of the United States, was saved by Saudi Arabia on several occasions. If they made direct investments in U.S. political campaigns, that's illegal. So they have to find intermediaries to do that with. We have allowed the Saudis, in the name of cheap oil, to rape and cheat and deceive the American public. You know, when you have this sort of dependence on money, it's very difficult, as any dependence, to criticize, you know, the source of your money. De dolda förbindelserna mellan USA och Saudiarabien visades tydligt upp av fransmannen Laurent Muraviek vid ett slutet möte i Pentagon. Politiskt är han en hög och tidigare rådgivare åt det franska försvarsdepartementet och samtidigt god vän till Richard Pearl. Richard Pearl m'a invité au Defense Policy Board pour qu'on lance un débat interne à l'administration sur l'Arabie Saoudite. J'étais personnellement extrêmement honoré que mon pays d'adoption me demande à moi, français, euh, de venir euh, au Pentagone, au Defense Policy Board, euh, participer à l'élaboration de la politique des États-Unis. It created a bit of an explosion when uh, there were newspaper accounts of what had been said in that briefing. Il y a eu une fuite. Euh, le contenu de mon briefing est apparu en première page du Washington Post et ça a créé un énorme scandale euh, puisque jusqu'alors, La question saoudienne était une question tabou. Miravieks rapport var allt annat än politiskt korrekt. Tonen var brutal. Analysen av den saudiska regimen utom ordentligt hård. Saudiarabien är ondskans kärna, den farligaste motståndaren i Mellanöstern. Saudierna är aktiva på alla nivåer i terroristkedjan, från planerare till finansiärer och operatörer. Saudierna är i själva verket en stam av primitiva urtidsmänniskor som fortplantar sig som kaniner. J'ai parlé des princes saoudiens qui pullulent comme le lapin en Australie, puisqu'il y a aujourd'hui aux alentours de 8000 princes saoudiens. The uh, portrayal he gave of Saudi Arabia was totally erroneous. And uh, but he made it clear that he was speaking as an individual. It was not a Rand position. But because it was said in a meeting of Defense Department advisors, it created a big explosion. His subsequent behavior uh, led to a determination by Rand that his services were no longer needed. Pourquoi? Parce qu'il y a dans la Maison Blanche euh, et dans l'entourage de la Maison Blanche des gens qui font partie de ce que j'appelle le lobby saoudien, qui est le plus puissant des lobbies étrangers euh, euh, à Washington. Euh, et ce sont les, les gens que le président Bush a hérité, en particulier de son père, qui euh, garde une certaine influence dans l'administration en particulier au département d'État, dont le chef Colin Powell fait lui aussi partie de ce lobby saoudien. George Bush bad skyndsamt den saudiska kronprinsen om ursäkt. Rapporten återspeglar inte mina egna, försvarsministerns eller vicepresidentens åsikter. Bush a appelé le prince héritier Abdallah euh, et j'ai perdu mon boulot. 
On m'a rapporté que euh, Carlucci avait en gros exigé, euh, exigé ma tête. Oh, well, I, I did, I, I did speak to the president of Rand Corporation, but uh, the Rand Corporation conducted its own investigation and made its own determination. Efter två års utredande publicerade kongressen rapporten om misslyckandena på underrättelseområdet inför den 11 september. Den innehöll svidande kritik mot administrationen, men man hade utlämnat allt som rörde förbindelserna mellan attentatsmännen och Saudiarabien. 30 sidor klassades som topphemliga och de försvann. Well, it wasn't lost, it was withheld by the executive branch and I think uh, probably because it would have revealed uh... Les 28 pages du rapport du Congrès euh, sur euh, le renseignement et le, le 11 septembre ont été euh, enlevées du, du rapport ou blanchies dans le rapport à la demande de, de l'exécutif. I mean, I think that's all you need to know. I mean, I think the American public pretty much figured out the Saudis. Now, President Bush has defended them. He's, he, what he's saying is they're our allies and that... And that Uh, everything's fine and they're helping in the war against terrorism. The fact is he invaded the wrong country. If he wanted to fight the war in, uh, on terrorism, he should have inv invaded Saudi Arabia, not Iraq. That's not where the war is and that's not who funded terrorists. It's take the attention away from what really is the cause of these events and, and put them on Saddam Hussein. It was a diversion. Everything has been a diversion. En vecka före jul fick presidenten den gåva han nästan hade gett upp hoppet om. Alla medier i USA, radio, tv och press följde Bush-regeringens linje. PR-bolagen som arbetade för Pentagon och Vita huset hade gjort sig förtjänta av sina arvorden. Maskinen gick för fullt. Ett enstaka undantag var en radiostation i Los Angeles som filosoferade. Om information är demokratins syre så har USA just gasats ihjäl. That was the right thing to do. Hussein is gone. A dictator is gone. Yeah, but where is the anthrax? Where are the nuclear bunkers? Where are all this stuff? They were wrong, but they, they can't admit it. The reality is he fooled us. He suckered us into a war in the Middle East based on very poor intelligence when there was no intelligence showing that they had weapons of mass destruction. All these things that the CIA, that, 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 that Colin Powell cited in his UN speech, these giant trucks moving around to these huge mobile weapons facilities, well, no one's found them. If you ask the neocons who said that they're weapons of mass destruction, Saddam was going to launch a nuclear war and all the rest of the stuff, they will tell you it doesn't matter. It was the morally right thing to do to go in. He was a bad guy. Does anyone believe that we would never have seen uh, weapons of mass destruction in the hands of Saddam Hussein if we had left him in place? I certainly don't. This war was stupid. They wrote articles about it. You have the generals from the first Gulf War wrote articles about it. You have other generals. The Pentagon hates the war. The generals do. The soldiers do. It was all driven by the hawks who are incapable of telling the truth. Nobody would ask, ask us to stand there and accept a strike that we knew was coming particularly if it involved a, a nuclear weapon or a chemical or a biological weapon. I don't think he realizes how unpopular America has become around the world. I really don't. I realized better than most people what this war would involve. I think most people thought there would be tens of thousands of people killed and it would be a long and very bloody war. I thought it would be over in three weeks with very few people killed. Now who was right? Över tusen döda och mer än 3000 sårade. Men amerikanska medier har följt instruktionerna och talar inte längre om krigsoffren. Pressen är bandlyst från flygbaserna dit liksäckare anländer varje dag. Soldaternas begravningar visas inte längre i tv. We're losing, you know, a dozen Americans a week and I'll tell you, if you drive up to Walter Reed Army Hospital and walk through the aisles up in Walter Reed Army Hospital and look at the kids who've lost arms, legs, who can't see anymore, who lost the lower half of their body, you'll understand what George Bush's war means. Now, is that price worth paying to get rid of Saddam? And I say no. 
as bad as he was. My, I always said along, let the Iraqis find somebody else to replace him, somebody they can live with. Now, there are some who say, turn sovereignty over right away. Well, to whom? And uh, wh wh what power? Who, who would I turn it over to if I was going to go to Baghdad today and say, I'm turning over all sovereignty? That was where the greatest folly was in the war. Democracy comes out of an inner impulse in a majority of the people in that country, one way or another, to change the way they live and have a more open and dignified life. You kind of bring it to them from outside. The hawks will say, if you turn the table over, it's good. You have democracy, you have civil societies, everybody be happier, they'll accept Israel. Um, they're pessimists like me, saying you turn the table over and you get something much worse. Neither Cheney, nor Pearl, nor Wolfowitz, nor Rumsfeld understood that 80% of that country is aligned with Iran. And that if we allowed free and democratic elections, we would get an Islamic Republic. I mean, the abysmal ignorance in this administration of the, of, of the region is one of the most frightening things I've ever seen. They don't deserve democracy in their own, by their own light. Indeed, they don't. They haven't fought for the democracy. In, in the case of Iraq, the only way a democracy could have come to that country is through a basic war against Saddam Hussein that they were able to win, which they've not been able to. Or the way they look at it today is this war was unjustified. It wasn't justified in their eyes. It was a war against Arabs, against Muslims. And so that will be a huge pool of recruits for bin Laden. If they don't know that going into it, you have to ask yourself, are these people qualified to manage the American Republic? I think we will probably uh, be looking at this history in a very dark way four, five, ten years down the road. Crow 40 Texas, 500 invånare och med en enda gata, precis som i westernfilmerna. Men här ligger också presidentens ranch. Med George Bush började en på nytt födelse. Den lilla stans affärer, mindre än ett dussin, har gjorts om till souvenirbutiker. Och de säljer föremål med anknytning till presidenten. Biblar, hagelbössor och alla slags prylar med hans bild. Och allt detta hoppas man ska bidra till att han blir omvald. George Bush truly does not realize the magnitude of his mistakes. He has been completely captured by his base, the neoconservatives, the evangelical Christians, and his big business campaign contributors. This president has more money than God. Uh, I mean, we, we are seeing more money in the political process by one candidate than any time in, in U.S. history. He's going to have $200 million to spend on the election cycle. His closest Democrat now has raised about $15 million. So you can see the disparity. On the other hand, if casualties have mounted, we've had a mini Tet offensive in Baghdad in the middle of the presidential campaign, then it could look very bad for President Bush. Defeat in Iraq will be a terrible historical and political defeat for George W. Bush personally. If the resistance gets much worse, which they expect it to get much worse, um, what we should be doing is counting the number of body bags, how many dead Americans are coming back. Several hundred Americans have, have lost their life there, and, and it doesn't look like Iraq is turning around. The American public is going to be, I think, skeptical while giving Bush another four years. Every president is at risk in the United States. If, if you lose the confidence of the public, you go home. Yeah, he could lose, he could lose. Let's hope. I januari 2004 medgav presidenten inför en envis reporter det han dessförinnan hela tiden förnekat. We, we've had no evidence that Saddam Hussein was involved with the September the 11th. Samtidigt gav presidentens före finansminister Paul O'Neill ut en bok där han hävdade att kriget hade planerats långt före den 11 september. O'Neill väntar nu åtal för att till pressen har läckt ett dokument från februari 2001 med titeln plan för ett Irak efter Saddam. Några dagar senare återvände David Kay tomhänt till Washington. Han hade lett teamet som letade efter massförstörelsevapen i Irak. Han hade tillsammans med 1400 vapeninspektörer i åtta månader genomsökt de väldiga ökenområdena i Irak utan resultat. I wanted to call them and ask them if they'd tell me exactly where they were since they seemed to be much more sure about their existence 
than those of us who were searching. The President of the United States. Visst tal till nationen räknade Bush med att David Kays resultat skulle ge tyngd åt hans påståenden. Already the Kay report identified dozens of weapons of mass destruction related program activities. Had we failed to act, the dictator's weapons of mass destruction programs would continue to this day. For all who love freedom and peace, the world without Saddam Hussein's regime is a better and safer place. I resigned essentially one day after the State of the Union address. I thought the politicians should have been far more cautious about what they were saying. He should have said, in my view, we were wrong. He didn't. There is an obligation to frankly acknowledge error. All the Iraqis we were talking to, despite the fact that I had millions of dollars I could have rewarded them with, I could have provided them a palatial living place in the United States if they had taken us to weapons of mass destruction. In spite of all these incentives, no Iraqi had a story that said they had weapons or they had ever had weapons. We were all manipulated by Saddam Hussein. And I include myself during my days as inspector. I think he was bluffing. It turned out we were almost all wrong in terms of his actually having weapons. Most of his weapons stockpile, the pre-91, had been destroyed during the 90s. There is no evidence that he recreated large stockpiles of chemical and biological weapons. And his nuclear program was a very pale shadow of a large program in the 1980s. It almost didn't exist. The April 5th speech of Secretary Powell really looks a bit ridiculous now in terms of what we found. David Kays avgång kom som ett bombnedslag, Colin Powell kommenterade. Om jag vetat vad David Kays skulle säga inför senaten hade jag avrått presidenten från att inleda stridshandlingar. Den 5 februari kommenterade CIA-chefen George Tenet för första gången offentligt. Vi kan ha överskattat Saddam Husseins framsteg. Vi har aldrig sagt att det fanns något omedelbart hot. The worst thing for a democracy is to suppress the truth in the interest of the election. The idea of preemptive military action every time you have a threat is a genuinely crazy idea. We went to war for the wrong reasons on the basis of a serious deception and error. George Bush gick slutligen med på att tillsätta en oberoende kommission som skulle utreda förekomsten av massförstörelsevapen. Det var tyngdpunkten i Washingtons motivering för kriget mot Irak. Kommissionens rapport ska avges 2005 efter presidentvalet i november. Because take away our playstations and we are a third world nation under the thumb of some blue blood royal son who stole the Oval Office and that phony election. I mean, it don't take a weatherman to look around and see the weather. Jeb said he'd deliver Florida folks, and boy, did he ever. And we hold these truths to be self-evident. Number one, George W. Bush is not president. Number two, America is not... Om tre veckor är vi tillbaka med en märklig historia om ett bankrån i det gamla kommunistiska Rumänien utfört av partifolk. God kväll. Who would dare to disrupt the calm of this secure country? Well, somebody did. On his daily route to local branches, the car of the bank was followed by a man and a woman in a taxi. As it stopped near the Jewish branch, the two passengers in the taxi were joined by three men. <laughs> 